Welcome to Life with David. I'm David, and today I have a flaky USB keyboard. I used it for one of my Raspberry Pis, and I would take it with me when I travel. However, now the I key doesn't work. It was pretty cheap, so I don't mind tearing into it. So why don't you join me as I examine how this keyboard works and why it doesn't. Computer keyboards evolved from early card key punch machines in the 40s and 50s to modified typewriters in the 50s and 60s. Teletype machines were used for early mini and microcomputers to provide both input and output capabilities. As video displays became more prevalent, increasingly keyboards became a separate input device. In the 60s and 70s, keyboards were often connected to their host using a parallel interface. However, that changed in 1981 when the IBM PC introduced us to serial interface standalone keyboards. The original keyboards used micro switches, read switches, and Hall effect sensors arranged in an electrical matrix that used diodes and transistor circuits to statically encode the selected key into 6, 7, or 8 data bits. Later circuits started using multiplexer integrated circuits to help with the encoding process. When USB keyboards became popular, small special purpose controllers were implemented that not only scanned and encoded the keyboard, but also handled the fairly complex USB communications. I got this keyboard about five years ago. It worked fine until recently when I noticed it wouldn't output either an upper or lowercase i. I've been able to fix similar keyboards by cleaning them, so I decided I'd give it a try. First, I removed all the screws from the back and separated the top from the bottom. Before I set the top aside, I noted where the letter I was on the elastomeric membrane and the underlying switch membrane. The switch membrane consists of two thin sheets of plastic that have conductive paint printed on them, one on the top and one on the bottom. The keys press on the areas where the conductive grids cross. When the key is pressed, the top sheet is pushed down onto the bottom sheet and contact is made between the conductive grids. A controller continuously scans the grids and when it sees contact, it notes the code of the key and waits for the computer to request the code. Sometimes a piece of form material can get lodged between the switch contacts, preventing them from conducting electricity when pressed. This happens more frequently to keyboards that have had a rough life. Since this keyboard has spent most of its life traveling with me, I figured this might have happened. I gently separated the plastic sheets and wiped the contacts for the letter I with a clean, dry cotton swab. I reassembled the keyboard and was disappointed that the I key still didn't work. So I tried again, this time using a cotton swab moistened with a little isopropyl alcohol. Unfortunately, the result was still the same. I knew the grids were intact because the adjacent keys on the same grid worked fine. There's a simple test to see if the controller recognizes the key. If you hold down any key, the letter will start to repeat. Then if you press a second key while holding down the first, the repeating character will stop. So I tried using I as the second character and the repeating character stopped. The controller had recognized the key press, it just failed to output the key code. That meant the key was clean and not the problem. The controller was toast. Let's see if we can find out how the controller failed. I plugged the keyboard into my PC and used Aqua Key Test to output the BIOS key code for the flaky keyboard. It in fact was outputting a code for the I key, however that code was not recognized as a legitimate code, so the computer ignored it. One thing I discovered is that nothing is simple when it comes to keyboard codes. For the IBM PC, there are four sets of keyboard codes. Set 1 for the original IBM PC, Set 2 for the IBM PC AT, Set 3 for the 101 key keyboard for the IBM PS2, and a set for the USB keyboards, which is what we mostly use now. In order to maintain some compatibility between keyboards, the raw key codes generated by the USB keyboard are first translated into a BIOS key code, and then further translated into a Windows key code. This is similar for a Linux machine. There are at least two translations between the raw keyboard scan codes and the user programs. 
I used the program EVTest on a Raspberry Pi to display the raw scan code for the I key. With a properly functioning USB keyboard, the least significant byte of the scan code was 0C, which agrees with the USB HID standards. This results in a BIOS key code of 0x17 and a Windows key code of 0x49. When I tried the faulty keyboard, the least significant byte was 8C, indicating that the most significant bit of the key map in the keyboard controller must have failed high. This resulted in a BIOS key code of 0x5C and a Windows key code of 0xEA, which are not recognized for standard US keyboards. If this was a really high-end keyboard, I would consider remapping the key scan codes within the computer operating system. But this is a cheap keyboard, so I'm just going to declare this a lost cause. However, this lets me do something else I love, dissecting non-working hardware and figuring out how it works. First, I remove the controller from the keyboard. It has 26 contacts that are pressed tightly against the conductive paint on the thin switching membrane sheets. There were 8 X contacts and 18 Y contacts. While I had the controller out, I tried shorting between an X and Y contact and was able to output a character to the computer. Then I located the Y grid that contained the I key, labeled Y5, and sequentially shorted it out to each of the X contacts. All the letters on that Y grid were recognized by the computer except for I, confirming that the controller was defective. How does the key scanning work? First, I measured the voltage of each contact with respect to the USB ground. The Y contacts were very close to zero, while the X contacts were measured around half a volt. So I decided to look at the X contacts on the scope. Each contact was essentially grounded most of the time with a short 5 volt pulse every 4 milliseconds. The signals of the X contacts were similar, except the pulses occurred at different points of time compared to the contact providing the trigger. By looking at the pulses that show up on the Y contact when the contacts are shorted, the controller can determine which X contact is shorting to the Y contact. The controller can then look up the proper key code and send it to the computer when requested. Thanks for joining me today. We looked at a broken keyboard to see how it was supposed to work. You could use this information to hack a keyboard if you needed to monitor several dry contacts that were close to the controller in an electrically quiet area. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If not, give it a thumbs down. And leave a comment or suggestion for things to do. I hope to do more of these videos, so please subscribe and click on the bell for notifications of new videos. Let's get together next time for another day in Life with David. See you soon!